Okay. Well, welcome everybody. It's a wonderful group of people who have registered to, to participate in this. We're delighted to have all of you here. You should know that I think that this is the largest audience we ever assembled for one of the FERG presentations. Um, we haven't actually assembled you, at least we've hooked you in, but assembling is another matter that we'll have to wait for less crazy times. Um, but in any event, um, it's a pleasure to have all of you here, and I'm honored to be able to introduce uh, Judith Kelly, the Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. Thank you so much, Joel. Uh, as Joel says, I'm Judith Kelly. I'm Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. Welcome to all of you. The Stand For series is organized by the Duke Sanford School of Public Policy, and we are honored to partner with Joel and his FERC seminar uh, and to welcome Elizabeth Alexander of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to the virtual Sanford. This series is created in honor of our founder, Terry Sanford, and it's designed to explore important policy conversations around justice, democracy, community, uh, human rights, and today we're looking at equity. And we want to highlight today the importance of philanthropy in a time of racial crisis. The Stand For uh, name of the series honors Terry Sanford who, who said that if you got into politics, you would have to be willing to stand for something, even if that defeats you. So be it, he said, you must stand for something. And this is surely a time when standing for something is something we all need to do. Uh, I wanna thank the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust Endowment Fund for uh, support. And uh, I also wanna encourage you to join us on the 17th of November, where we will take a stand together for human rights. And we will have a global health expert, Gavin Yami and, and, and myself, we will engage in a dialogue with uh, the president of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband. Uh, thank you to our event partners, Joel Fleischmann's Foundation Impact Research Group Seminar Series and, uh, and the Center for Strategic Philanthropy and Civil Society. The mission of the Stanford School is to improve lives and communities by researching the most pressing public policy issues and preparing students for a life of engagement, um, public service, and leadership. And so therefore, I'm pleased to invite a student to introduce Joel Fleischmann, which had to be done because if I had to introduce Joel Fleischmann, we would never get to the seminar because I would just go on and on. So to constrain me, Instead, we're going to have a student introduce Joel. Uh, take it away, Lee Foster. Thank, Thank you. you, Dean Kelly. Happy to take that off your hands. Um, so Joel Fleisch Fleischman is a professor of law and public policy and director of the Samuel and Ronnie Heyman Center for Ethics, Public Policy, and the Professions and director of the Duke Samford Center for Strategic Philanthropy and Civil Society. He also directs the Duke Foundation Impact Research Group seminar series, of which this seminar is a part. He has published a plethora of books, including his most recent, Putting Wealth to Work, Philanthropy for Today or Investing for Tomorrow. His other writings deal with legal regulation and financing of political activities, as well as the regulation of non-for-profit organizations. Professor Fleischman is a native of Fayetteville, North Carolina. He went back and forth between Yale and working for the governor of the state, the Sanford School's founder, Terry Sanford, who brought Professor Fleischman here in 1971 as a member of the law faculty and director of the Institute of Policy Sciences and Public Affairs, now Duke Sanford School of Public Policy. I have had the pleasure of working with Joel for two years as his TA and research assistant while I complete my Master of Public Policy and MBA here at Stanford and the Fuqua School of Business. And I'm honored to be introducing him today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lee. Um, and thank you, Judith, for your kind words. And welcome again to everybody. Um, our, our distinguished guest, um, uh, is, um, I think, known to many, um, and she's known for being many things, all of them good. Um, I, I wrote a long introduction, but I'm going to constrain myself and simply say that, you know, that, that um, Elizabeth, um, it, her parents were distinguished 
African Americans and distinguished Americans. Her father was the chairman of the of the Equal Opportunity Equal Employment Opportunity Commission during Lyndon Johnson's presidency from 1967 to 19 to 1969, and he was Secretary of the Army during the presidency of Jimmy Carter from 1977 to 1981. Elizabeth herself was born in New York. Um, she went to, to Yale College uh, to un undergraduate school. Uh, she um, was. A, she says that uh, that she was attracted then to go after Yale to go to go study at um, uh, at Boston University because there was a remarkable poet born in St. Lucia in the West Indies, Professor Walcott. Um, with, he inspired her, in fact, in her writing career um, on poetry. He was a great poet. Um, and she's just carried forth. She, she's taught at Yale. She's taught at uh, Columbia. Um, uh, she's taught at, uh, she got, all, I should say that she got her PhD uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and she's won many distinguished awards along the way, including an honorary doctor of letters from Yale in 2018. Um, uh, she was also, the, she became the only the first poet to read at an American presidential inauguration after Robert Frost in 1961, Maya Angelou in 1993, and Miller Williams in, 19, in 2019. And she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, she is, um, the, the invitation was sparked really uh, in large part by the decision that she made and, and was announced in an article in the Chronicle of Philanthropy in July 1920, which said that the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the largest humanities philanthropy in the United States, announced that it is adjusting its mission to give greater emphasis in its great grant giving to programs that promote social justice. The Mellon Foundation typically gives out roughly $300 million a year in grants to arts and humanities organizations. This year, because of the economic losses created by the pandemic, it is planning to distribute $500 million, very significant increase. We're exceedingly fortunate that Elizabeth Alexander has agreed to talk to us about what that declared change of mission will mean for the foundation's grant making. I should want to close by saying that last fall, Elizabeth and I had the privilege of being together on a panel discussion before a group of foundation endowment managers in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, unlike um, all of them started their remarks with definitely with prosaic prose. Elizabeth, however, opened her comments with a moving quotation from a poem written by the prize-winning Gwendolyn Brooks. And the quotation is, uh, it is lonesome, yes, for we are the last of the loud. Nevertheless, live, conduct your blooming in the noise and whip of the whirl whirlwind. Uh, it is a great honor to have Elizabeth with us today. Elizabeth, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. Joel, I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you for bringing me to Duke, uh, a place that has been in my heart for a very long time uh, for many reasons, starting with watching Grant Hill play basketball <laughs> many years ago, uh, moving forward to uh, the presidency of my wonderful friend and former professor, D Dick Broadhead, uh, and so many other reasons, and uh, including um, uh, being very honored to receive an honorary degree from you all. So um, there are so many ways that uh, Duke has made me feel uh, happy and at home. And there's so much that has happened at Duke over the years that I have admired. Uh, I, I feel I must call the name of the great John Hope Franklin, uh, who is someone uh, who, you know, I, I walk along with so many uh, in the light that he cast with his scholarship and his example. Um, so 
All of that, though we are on Zoom, uh, brings me here and brings me here happily. Uh, to be in your classroom, uh, I thought we were gonna be in your classroom when we first started. Uh, and now we are, uh, we are in a much wider world than that, which is wonderful. Um, uh, meeting uh, Joel through our friend, our dear friend, Darren Walker, as I was beginning my life in philanthropy not so long ago, um, uh, through your writings and through your friendship, uh, you have been a mentor to me. So um, I'm very happy to be with you today and we have so much to talk about. Indeed, that's great. Cassie, you are going to recognize people who wanna ask any questions, but for the time being, um, Elizabeth, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about what the new direction, um, the modification um, of, the po of the policy for the Mellon Foundation really means in terms of, of uh, we know what it, the, the, press the press release said, but um, uh, the, the detail is in your mind. And <laughs> I would love to have you expound on that. Well, yes. Well, when I when I uh, assumed the presidency two years and a few months ago, um, I knew that as the nation's largest funder in arts and culture, the nation's largest funder in the humanities and higher education, uh, and also, of course, our work in archives, libraries, scholarship. Um, that's that's the stuff of life. That's the way that I understand that human beings understand who we are in community who we are individually, how we might look to the past in order to move forward. Um, this is what I had spent my whole teaching life and my whole artist's life understanding the power and impact uh, that the arts uh, and humanities could have. So I stepped in with that pride of a sense of, and we were coming upon our 50th anniversary. Uh, so proud to know that Mellon had made that commitment over all of this time. At the same time, you know, I think this is an interesting moment of a shift in philanthropy. I had spent two years working as the uh, director of creativity and free expression at the Ford Foundation. And that is the work that Ford does in arts and culture, documentary film and new media and journalism. And the Ford Foundation uh, under Darren Walker's leadership had charged all of us grant makers with understanding that all of our grants had to, in some way, to use our charge, disrupt inequality. Now, how do you interpret that? I found that that simple question, how is your grant disrupting inequality, was very useful to me because it built upon a kind of thinking that comes to me from my lifelong commitments in African-American studies and women's and gender studies, where we're always asking, Who's at the table? Who's not at the table? How are resources dispersed? Who's in the canon? Who's not included in the canon? What are, what are the knowledges that we should know about that are cast to the side? And finally, who are the people in our culture and history, the cultures, the traditions that have been under-resourced and that affects actually sometimes how we measure their import. Uh, you know, if you if you uh, teach a text over and over and over and over again and you put it in the core curriculum and you say everyone has to read it and you do it year after year after year after year and you ask all the freshmen to memorize it, it's going to start to feel important. So um, I think that having that kind of analysis that says, you know, things are not equally distributed, how can we address that? That says, here we know the center what do we look at from the margins and how do we think about changing that balance? So from there, you know, coming to Mellon and saying, how can we continue to, you know, fund, we still fund the same stuff, if you will, that we used to, uh, but now um, our lens is sharper to think about um, those very questions I've laid out. Um, you know, at one point um, you, uh, and you, you stated in, your interview with, with Darren, um, that when you were at the Ford Foundation, um, you had, uh, you always asked the question, that every grant must answer the question, does this disrupt equality in some way? And I guess uh, the question is, is that the same question 
you are asking yourself about each of the grants that will be considered by the Andrew Mellon Foundation? Well, no, because of course we're a different foundation and because we have to do it our way. Uh, and, um, but also, you know, there are important nuances. So to me, asking about social justice means that we are able to think about how is the work we support contributing to a fair and just and flourishing society. If we value, as we do, <clears throat> higher education, you know, as, as, you know, major funders of the humanities and higher education, if we believe that higher education in the humanities is transformative, if we believe that it gives us tools for living and thriving, then to me, asking our questions means that we say, okay, look how disproportionately we've given in the heavily resourced Ivy League, for example and look where we haven't given our money. So that now we are significantly contributing to community colleges where guess what? There are a larger percentage of humanities majors at community colleges, who knew, not me, uh, than there are at, uh, at universities like, like Duke and Yale. Um, that means that we are very, very proud to be the nation's largest funder in prison higher education prison higher education that leads to the degree. Because if ever, you know, lives were in need of transformation, uh, and if ever people needed to be equipped with what we fervently believe a strong humanity edu humanities education gives you, it is people who are incarcerated, understanding as we do that the crisis of over-incarceration in this country and the disproportionate way it affects black and brown communities is something that we, we, can't, we can't act like it's not happening. So I'm, I, I'm not right with myself if I think that, you know, my kids in a seminar room at Yale are having all of these wonderful things made available to them, but that a mile down the road in, in, you know, in the prison, that someone can't take that time and learn so that we expect all of those people to be able to contribute in a positive way to our society when they finish their education. And the numbers are, of course, very significant. How many, how many um, young African American males are, um, and probably some females as well, incarcerated? It, and it's somewhere around two million, isn't it, in the United States? Well, the, the statistic that I um, uh, hold to that is a, you know, particularly just. Um, I almost can't process it, is that um, one out of three black males uh, in their lifetime will be uh, in some way uh, involved in the criminal justice system. Right. Um, so, you know, um, can't act like that's not happening, but I think that also the, the converse of that is, what do we do? You know, we sit here in Wonderland you know, knowing, I mean, our work with arts and culture as well. You know, we, we sit here knowing, I, I'm a poet, I, I know how the arts change the way uh, we live in the world, right? Um, so how do we think about what the institutions we support, how are they thinking about what's on the walls? You know, Mellon has done some um, very important research uh, on uh, American museums. Uh, that have quantified um, uh, the racial disparity um, between, you know, who is at what level on the staff and who's making curatorial or intellectual, as they call them, decisions. Um, and that has also revealed that um, when you look at museum leadership, that there are a lot of women who lead museums, but not the most resourced museums. They're in the, in, the, in the lower half of, uh, of, of resources in museums. So when you think about um, equity and resources, all of this helps us to analyze because even with all of, of, of the, the, the funds that we have, um, as you know, I mean, one of the most sobering things about coming into philanthropy is, you know, you sit on top of this big pot of money and the need, it, you know, it could, be, it could be gone in a moment. Um, so you have to learn to be so targeted and so strategic. Um, and for us, 
one of the questions that we ask is what resources do our grantees have access to? Um, because that's very important when you think about, um, and of course, artistic excellence, the brilliance of ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Right. One of the things I noticed that you, I mean, there were the chapter that you were in Darren's book, you described the program at Reed College um, in which, which had been historically, the focus at all has been on Athens um, and that part of the, the initiative that you supported there involved bringing in other areas for, uh, you know, I think um, uh, Mexico City, Harlem, and so forth, inclusion. Are you, are you open to that kind of, um, uh, of grant making requests from other colleges to expand the focus of some of their courses to include areas like Mexico City and Harlem or, or whatever they choose? Well, what I thought was so interesting about that, uh, that Reed College grant is it really opened up and they're a school that has a core curriculum. So already we've moved out of just what, you know, one professor or one department or one division is doing. This is the core curriculum that everyone has to pass through. This is part of the DNA of the college that its graduates sort of take out into the world. So it's, it's offering up a portable idea. So I mentioned that just to give a sense of the scale of import uh, that helped us consider that grant. And then the opening up of the question of what is a classic? Uh, what are the classics? What is a classic? Uh, how do we think about human beings over time in different parts of the world and how they have explored and expressed and passed on their sense of what it is to be human in that particular place, in that particular point in time. So I think that, you know, one of the aspects of the culture wars uh, in, you know, sort of positing certain cultures as being important and certain knowledges as being eternal um, is something that, you know, is, I mean, it's just simply misleading. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, it's time, and this is, you know, been how my time in the academy has been characterized, and there's so much amazing work that's going on that says, here are all of these traditions, and uh, in order to enrich uh, ourselves and our students, um, we need to broaden our understanding of them. Um, the, 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 I read about the Mellon Mays um, uh, uh, undergraduate fellowship program. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's as I read about it, part of the part of the mission there is to uh, attract more African American and other brown and other minority students to, to get a four year co four year college education uh, and so forth. My sense is that, that the Mellon Foundation has has done that before uh, in, in in its grant making, and in a sense, this is an expansion of what they the Mel your predecessors at the foundation did, since they recognized the need to attract more African Americans, for example, uh, into college and graduate school, et cetera. And, uh, and, and that your hope will be to increase the even further the, that uh, that goal. Well, the program you, you referenced, the Mellon Mays program, which we call MMUF, uh, and uh, it is really one of our jewels in the crown um, uh, that has, um, it's not just about attracting um, students of color, not just African-American students to four-year college, but rather um, it's about um, attracting them to and mentoring them through the PhD. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, what we were finding with a lot of those um, young people is that um, a PhD, uh, not, not that all uh, uh, students of color are first generation, not, not hardly, but um, that sometimes for those who were, um, you know, become a doctor, become a lawyer, become an engineer, sometimes a PhD can seem quite abstract and impractical. In fact, sometimes it can be abstract and impractical. Um, um, but, um, you know, for people who are, you know, if you if you have a calling to, you know, work with objects and become an art historian, if you have, and, but you might channel that in another way, were it not for a program that could, you know, show you the way. Um, we felt that, you know, the idea behind this, which is from my, my several presidents back predecessor, Bill Bowen, 
Mm-hmm. What we see now with the seed that Bill Bowen planted with MMUF is that um, it has helped to increase numbers. We have college presidents who are went through MMUF um, uh, and, and many, many um, people who have, have made their way through the PhD. But the issue we're now trying to, to solve pointedly um, uh, about diversity in the academy is that levels of upper leadership are still stubbornly uh, uh, insufficiently integrated. Um, it, you know, if you saw recently, um, as I'm sure many of you did in uh, Time Magazine, the, um, uh, the, the headshots of the people of power in different industries, the you know, top 25 uh, companies, this and that and the other thing, higher ed didn't look so good. Um, and so um, I think that, you know, we're learning with others um, about how to really think about cracking that question. Uh, of diversifying higher leadership, and it doesn't happen just with a snap. Right. Um, the uh, you in, in your uh, one of the things that you said uh, in your um, in your chapter in Darren's book was the following. Um, uh, it said part of my career has been teaching socioeconomically, ideologically, and experientially mixed groups of kids largely white because of the universities where I taught, but crucially still mixed about the challenges of African-American studies and having these students confront things that they had not before, learn how to move that racial conversation forward and see how transformative and productive that is. All the while they're falling in love with black culture and also learning to write, speak and analyze with sharp clarity. can you just amplify that a little bit and expand it? Sure, I would be I would be happy to. Um, so my uh, my PhD is in English, uh, and my and I through my entire teaching career taught literature, African American literature, and that expanded over the years to teaching African American culture more broadly, film, uh, visual arts, uh, performing arts, and so forth, and. Uh, I taught at University of Chicago, taught at Haverford College, directed the Poetry Center at Smith College, and then for 15 years was at Yale where I chaired the African American Studies Department. So I say all that to say that thinking about all of those um, institutions, uh, the demographics, you know, these are still predominantly white institutions, although, you know, very, very mixed. And I believe, I have experienced uh, that culture, and let's just stay with literature for the moment, um, is a way that people can, first of all, you know, learn about other human beings. I think that's one of the reasons that we enter culture, but that also in African American studies, we can have very difficult conversations uh, that are, you know, with the vehicle of culture, they can be had. Um, I, I, I send students out into the world, you know, who have been through the tough challenges and tough conversations in the safe space of a classroom uh, that I think prepare them for the time we're living in right now, the time of racial conflagration. You know, the, the poet uh, uh, Lucille Clifton, who's uh, late poet Lucille Clifton, who's been uh, so important to so many of us, uh, would say that if you have a conversation uh, that is uncomfortable about race. She said, you will be uncomfortable, but you will not die from it. <laughs> right. So this is to say, you know, I don't know where this idea that we're supposed to be comfortable, you know, that, that I mean, I think that grappling with difficult questions across difference is what it means to build durable bonds in community. And so I really I have been, happily surprised at how much um, the kind of proof of the classroom and the proof of sharing that culture with others uh, has given me uh, faith in our ability to move forward through further difficulty. Very interesting um, and true. Um, let me just say to the, those on the call that if you'd like to say anything or ask questions, um, please get in line at the chat box so okay. that um, Cassie will be able to call on you when the time comes. We're not there yet, but I just want to be sure that, that as questions arise, be feel, uh, be, be moved to get you yet in line. 
Um, in, the, in, your, in your conversation with Darren, you talked about the Equal Justice Initiative and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice that Brian Stevenson put together. Sounds like a very exciting enterprise. Say a few words about that. I didn't know about it. I just, so I'm glad to know about it. It's amazing. I'd love to talk about it. And I'd love to talk about it actually in a larger context. That would be great. If we, um, uh, if, uh, we, we, we have almost hot off the presses, but um, our latest initiative at Mellon, um, uh, the biggest initiative in the foundation's history, uh, we just have launched to the world last week and it's called the Monuments Project. And uh, the foundation is devoting $250 million, again, biggest we've ever done over five years to think thinking about the commemorative landscape, mostly in the United States monuments, memorials, uh, thinking about that term very broadly. So not just statues, uh, but rather places like the Equal Justice Initiative, which we've supported quite robustly. It is um, part of the brilliant vision of Brian Stevenson, who, um, as you probably know, started as, um, as a lawyer and was de defending, um, uh, as he would say, um, the disfavored among us. Uh, so, you know, uh, people who are on death row and unjustly accused, uh, people who one of his clients was a woman who was um, charged with capital murder for having a stillborn child. I mean, these are incredible, incredible stories. And he defended these people um, because he also was operating on the understanding that if you are wealthy and guilty in America, you have a better chance of getting off than if you're poor and innocent. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he realized um, after doing this, this uh, representing you know, clients is that narrative change and storytelling were a very, very important part of how he was gonna be able to move this work forward because he would get into the classroom and he's in Montgomery, Alabama and he's dealing mostly with black clients and he would get into the classroom and realize that there were so many negative stereotypes and assumptions about black criminality. I mean, it, it breaks my heart even, even to, to, to acknowledge the extent of it. Um, so for him, the question is, how do we tell, really tell the history of this country? How living in you know, a place where the Confederacy is revered what does that teach us? And how do we teach people something different? What does it mean that when you look at all of the Confederate statuary, mo most of it, which was put up long after the Civil War was lost, long after, to instantiate white supremacy anew? What is that teaching people? So he said, let's teach people something else. So he built a museum, uh, uh, an incredible didactic museum in Montgomery. In that museum, um, he tells the story of from slavery to mass incarceration. He also did um, research into cases of lynchings that had not been marked or commemorated. So imagine you're going down the Jefferson Davis Highway and he goes, his staff, and say, this is where John Smith was lynched. We're gonna dig soil from this place. We're gonna mark this place. We're gonna say that this happened here. And then we're gonna put that soil in the jar. We're gonna put this gentleman's name and we're gonna bring it back and we're gonna line them up in our museum. Then the next part of the Memorial for Peace and Justice, which to any of you who have gone and um, Joel, you must go. It is, um, it is a profound and stirring place. He, you walk into, I say it's sort of a, a cathedral of commemoration and grieving where large slabs hang from a sort of a cathedral ceiling, marking counties and names of people who were lynched. And imagine going into that space. And the thing that's so powerful is some people are there who are learning about, didn't know anything about lynching, they're learning for the first time. But some people are there, they're elders, and maybe they're looking for their county or their neighbor or their uncle and finding them there. The final part of that memorial is there are replicas of those slabs that are waiting for all these counties across the South to claim and tell the history there. So there's a whole nother story that's told both with 
what has been taken by communities so that our landscape is more completely marked, but also what may go unclaimed because communities aren't ready to tell that story. There's a, a, a group led by Michael Murphy called Mass Design that designed that memorial. And it's one of, uh, you know, I, I, I now I've gone, I go to as many of these kinds of places as I can. Um, and uh, it is one of the most stirring such place that I think you could see on earth. So we supported them in a very big way um, because we thought that that integrated vision was a way of saying, let's tell American history in its fulsomeness. Right. Makes, it makes absolutely great sense to fill a need that's really there. Yes. Um, um, and I guess that, that the, the Million Books Project is sort of related to that as well, a $5.3 million grant to that project. Um, I, it wasn't clear to me from what you said that the, the books are limited to the humanities or will they also include social justice matters from social sciences, law and other, other economics and other fields? Well, I'm so glad you asked about the Million Books Project. It is um, a, a dream, uh, really an amazing dream. And you know, this job is, it's, it's challenging, it's hard, it's humbling and it's also exhilarating. And putting this project together, um, there um, is a, a, an amazing man named Dwayne Betts, uh, who, uh, when he was 16 years old, uh, he was um, convicted of a nonviolent carjacking. He had a very long sentence, uh, overly long sentence that included bouts of solitary confinement. While in solitary confinement, he discovered and was saved by poetry. Uh, became an avid poetry reader, po books of poems slipped under his uh, cell when he was in solitary, a kid, right? Um, reading and reading and memorizing poems, books handed to him by fellow inmates who say, you know, you got to read this. Um, and when he came out, he went to University of Maryland. He, I believe, became the valedictorian. He became a poet. I met him in a poetry community uh, that I helped establish uh, called Cave Canem. And, you know, here he was just this remarkable person hungry for words. He went on to Yale Law School. He's now getting a PhD at Yale. Um, and he came up and, and strikingly, he continues to work inside of prisons. He wrote a memoir about his incarceration and, and, and several very, very fine books. That only begins to describe him, but his idea and the idea that we funded out of the Justice Collaboratory, it's called at Yale Law School, is that 500 book libraries would go, actual libraries, actual books into every prison in this land, 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, men's facilities, women's facilities, juvenile facilities. And that um, the process, so you ask about what books will be in there, the process, Dwayne has turned it into a huge collaborative process where, you know, I say like, Dwayne, I don't know if you wanna ask everyone everywhere you go, like what books do you think should be on this list? But it's beautiful because it's, um, it's been turned wide open. So I, it, it's not so much that it is a humanities or not a humanities library, it's, it's a great books library but you know, from the perspective of thinking about what are the great books that you would want, that, that anybody would want. I mean, so we're also kind of hoping that once he compiles the list, it will be a fascinating list that, that everyone might think, you know, it might be a substitute to other notions of the great books. Right. Um, and that these will also be in the artist Titus Kafar is designing a bookshelf that will be put in these facilities so that space is marked. You know, I think part of the power, and this I just say as a girl who loves to read, right? Of the freedom of browsing, the freedom of saying, you know, let me pick this one and not that one. That is something that everyone deserves. And, and, and we believe, again, you know, does reading set your mind free? Does reading allow you to imagine freedom? Uh, if so, how do we think reading should be made available? Because what I should have started with is getting books, actual books into prisons has become harder and harder. 
And that's part of the project too, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. And you know, sort of an outdated Lexus Nexus is not like, does not a, you know, transcendent reader make. I mean, you know, um, so it's to me, um, and again, back to the question of, you know, what is social justice philanthropy? There is nothing inconsistent with that and Mellon's longtime 50 year commitment to the humanity. What we're just saying is we believe in it so much that we have to ask who does it benefit? Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, the, you also talked about um, something else I wanted to ask you. Um, you're, you're, the way you described, I hadn't thought about it that way, but the way you described being in prison uh, as, as turning, you know, turning in, incarcerated time into learning time and mind expanding time for many prisoners. And I guess that there are many examples of, 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 of things that prisoners have written by, by virtue, both either while they're still in prison or reflecting on the, the time in prison that the books really did facilitate their thinking about. Well, there's, um, you know, if you think about, and, and I, I would put um, uh, those works that you're referring to along a continuum with the slave narrative. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at Frederick Douglass, if you look at Olauda Equiano, if you look at the great American slave narratives, very often it is the moment where literacy is attained that the enslaved person can imagine freedom or begins to move towards freedom, understands there are worlds outside of the world that confines them. Moving forward, you know, the, 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 the greatest example, though there are many of them, might be the autobiography of Malcolm X and his scene of learning and the, and the, the book that he's uh, working with most extensively, he starts to read the dictionary, um, which I've not done, I feel I should do. Um, uh, but, you know, um, uh, and, and again, you know, what, 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 what opportunity that, that provides. Um, so I, I, think it's, I think it's very, very important. Uh, and actually, I think it's, um, I think that, I think reading and, and having access to books, you know, just like we're now also starting to fund more projects in public libraries. I think it is a right. I think that our society is not free, fair, and democratic without robust public libraries. So again, I'm just continuing to illustrate the way of thinking. Um, have you had any conversations with Julie Sandorf at the Mellon Foundation? I'm sorry, at the, uh, uh, at the um, uh, what's the name of the foundation? In Repson. Europe? Yeah. Repson. Uh, no, I have not. I have not in my, uh, in my, my continuing to make friends in philanthropy, I, I have not yet met her, tell me. Well, she's been very active in the public library world. Uh, and she's been, uh, she's helped develop the New York Public Library's plan for, uh, for multiple uses of building, new buildings on library land, library owned land that included upgrading the libraries. But she's been deeply involved in expanding the role of the libraries in New York. Oh, that's great. Well, I will make sure to meet her. That's great. Absolutely terrific person. Mm -hmm. uh, she's also very passionate about the, the um, closure of lots of local newspapers. And she's been actually leading the battle. She started the, the new uh, um, site in New York called thecity.com. Have you ever looked at that? I should know. You're telling me all the things I ought to know in it's my a, hometown. A 24 hour news site that covers all, only news in New York at, wow. the, at, the, at the local level and in the, and in the, in the neighborhoods and everything else. It's a fascinating story, but she's passionate on the subject of the, the role that libraries could play uh, in a variety of different ways in general and also in dealing with particular problems. I think you find it worthwhile having a conversation with her. I, I will definitely reach out to her. Um, so as we move towards the public question answering, um, you know, my sense is that, that, you know, that you're doing a lot of things to continue what the um, uh, Melvin Foundation has done in the past, as well as really pushing out the boundaries, whether it's in public, publishing books, uh, dealing with race or 
experiences, monuments. I didn't know about, I had heard about the monuments initiative, but I didn't know in detail about it. And as you describe it, again, something fascinating. You wonder the, why it's taken so long to do this. Um, I, waiting on you, I think. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but the, you, uh, all of these things, the what you described about the Equal Justice Initiative, again, something, an experience that I think many of us should have at, at some point. Um, what, what else would you like to talk about that from your reflecting, you know, it, it, I bet you there are not very many um, professors of poetry or practitioners of poetry who are running foundations. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, yes, there, I think that um, my friend Ed Hirsch runs the Guggenheim Foundation. And so when when he uh, when he first became uh, president of Guggenheim, maybe I don't know about twenty years ago, uh, the poetry world was you know just like what <laughs> one of us <laughs> we can we can we can do more than just make pretty things. Um, but I think that actually, um, in all seriousness, when when I think about um, the long practices of my career and, and what they allow me to bring to work in philanthropy. I think that coming from um, um, African-American studies, again, has given me uh, a rigorous critical mindset for asking the questions. I mean, you know, if you only look at what's right in front of you and you don't think about what's not there, if you only look at who's around the table with you and don't remember about who's not at the table, you just won't have as complex a critical interpretation of the world that you live in. So there's that. We've talked about the teaching, which I think actually also translates out to management. Um, uh, I think that you know, thinking about what it means to uh, encourage people to um, speak, uh, to express themselves, to be part of a collective, to be concise, to be precise, uh, to be venturesome in their thinking. Uh, at the end of my exams, uh, uh, when I would write my exams, I would say um, always that I would rather um, uh, a brave venture. I can't remember how I put it, but you know, sort of venture bravely rather than be timid and tidy. You know, that that's not very interesting to me. So um, creating, you know, communities where um, everyone can contribute and be generative, but also where we're honing our powers of expression and critical thinking and coming in African-American studies and in poetry from wildly under-resourced but tremendously resourceful areas has given me a very keen understanding of the amazing things that people are able to do with, you know, uh, you know, a pot of hot water and a stone. But what does that mean when we find the best of that and say, and now we can resource you better so that your ideas can fly? Um, so you know, we we bring a lot of uh, uh, of uh, whatever our unique backgrounds are, and I think I wonder what you think, Joel. But um, I think. Um, we don't want too many career philanthropists in philanthropy. You know, we want people who, uh, you know, it's one of the, the, the joys of philanthropy is that it's a, it's a hodgepodge. People yes. come from many fields and many worlds and many expertises and knowledges and points of view. Right, I agree with you. You know, I, I'd never heard of Derek Walcott until I read your biography. Um, uh, Derek Walcott, it says, was a Nobel Prize winner Yes. Um, for, for poetry. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about him. He obviously inspired you, uh, and that's a great blessing for all of us. Oh, well, you know, he was, yeah, he won the Nobel Prize for um, literature, which um, isn't always won by a poet. This year it was won by uh, an American uh, woman poet, Louise, uh, Louise Glick, and that's a very rare thing. Um, and uh, Walcott um, was, I found his work on my own when I was an undergraduate. It wasn't taught in any of the classes. Um, I was in the library and I found, uh, you know, just looking at, now look, talk about walking into a library. You know, there, you might even know this, this library um, that it, at, at Yale, it's not the way that it used to be, but it had all of the periodicals and journals and things out. Yes, I remember. So you could go and spend all afternoon and go pick things or read serially and, and, and hunt and pack and find things. So I would just go there and go there and go there and go there and read and read and read and read and read and read. And I found the New York Review of Books and they published his poems. 
And they just, uh, they just rocked my world. When I applied to go to Boston University, I was actually working as a journalist. I was working at the Washington Post. Um, and that was fascinating work, but I was beginning to have a sense that I wanted to do a different kind of, I wanted to do a different kind of writing. Um, I had written short stories. I applied to this program. I had said I was never going to go to graduate school. My mother tricked me and said like, oh, just apply to this program and you know, you probably won't get in. And if you don't get in, you don't have to go. But then I got in. So I was like, ah, now I got to go. <laughs> and then I, I presented myself to this teacher and, uh, and, and it, you know, it changed my life. He was, um, he was very gruff, very loving, very meticulous, very rigorous, um, wrote every day, lived by the word, uh, revered the word. And uh, he saw in me, it's that rare thing that we hope happens in our relationships of any kind that someone says, I see you, I see this thing in you. That maybe he told me I was a poet. I did not know I was a poet. <laughs> I, I liked that poet's work, um, and uh, you know, then I just started, uh, you know, completely committing myself to the work of making poems. Extraordinary story, and uh, I wish more uh, faculty members at different universities um, were teaching poetry. I, I don't. I don't I'm, it doesn't seem to me to be thriving at this point. Uh, well, actually, actually, to speak about poetry, um, um, poetry actually is thriving now. Um, I think at universities, yeah. Uh, you know, if you look at, you know, so um, I, I'm a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and, and, and they have a wonderful uh, website, poets.org. Um, and one of the ways, you know, with the arts, you know how in philanthropy everyone wants, wants to know about outcomes. Right. Yes. Uh, when I would first he hear this question, people would say, well, you know, can you measure it? What are the outcomes? I would get very salty. You know, I'd be like, well, would you like to live without art? Would you like to live without literature? Would you like to live without, you know, like we, we, we die without these things. But some things you actually can measure and um, the number of hits to poems and certain poems uh, at, uh, at the Academy of American Poet have been rising and rising and rising. Um, we funded some beautiful projects where poets laureates in different parts of the country have done, you know, projects that involve them with communities. So it's actually a beautiful, beautiful time for poetry. After the last presidential election, there were millions of hits to the Langston Hughes poem, and this was right after the election, Let America Be America Again. So, you know, it's, it's interesting how we're, some people are now trying to, to say, how can we measure this necessary thing that has existed across culture, across time, and will never die? Right. Have you drawn Garrison Keillor into anything that you're uh, doing in, in the world, world of poetry? We, we haven't. You know, it's funny. I, I haven't um, kept up with what he's doing lately, but I think he figured out something wonderful. Um, with, I don't think it's on the air anymore, is it? When he used to do- I heard it, yeah. Poems. I think it was financed by the, um, the Poetry Foundation in Chicago. Um, yes, it, and then I think they maybe stopped financing it because they don't, um, they don't actually fund a lot of things. You know, foundation is a funny, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a conventional foundation, the Poetry Foundation. Right. Um, but I love, I mean, those were wonderful. Tracy K. Smith, um, who was our poet laureate before this one, Joy Harjo, did a beautiful thing called The Slowdown, uh, which was a podcast where five minutes a day, uh, you know, she'd read a poem in her beautiful voice by other poets and then talk about what she saw in it. And you could kind of be left with that through the day. So I think actually poetry is very, um, very portable, very... Um, shareable uh, and quite fundable. Right. Well, I, I hope that that's one thing that you could do at the Mellon Foundation is, is support um, the public exposure of good poetry by people because there are a lot of good poets of all races uh, and that would fit uh, your, uh, I think the, your goal of having more people use the sensitivity 
Oh. No, we're, we're there. We support, we do support a lot of poetry projects. So, so thank you for that. We are of, of one mind. Well, Cassie tells me that there, uh, there's some good questions in the chat box at this point. And so um, while we're five minutes early in getting there, I think we should start with that and give the audience a chance to do that. So Cassie, would you uh, start calling on people who've registered? I'm happy to do so. Okay, the first one comes from Barbara Lau from the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice. Barbara, if you'll unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much, Cassie. And thank you, Dr. Alexander. Uh, we, of course, know you because you wrote the new introduction to Polly Murray's re-released book of poems, uh, Proud Shoes. We are the uh, caretakers for Polly Murray's childhood home, which is now a national historic landmark oh, and located here in Durham. And we work closely with the Duke Human Rights Center and the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute here at Duke. Um, so my question is a little bit about people like us who are smaller grassroots community-based history, uh, history sites and historic organizations that are often the people really trying to do the work you're talking about, disrupting the dominant narratives, trying to recenter narratives of people like Polly Murray, other black women, other LGBTQ folks. So I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about what role we might play in this bigger process that you have committed the foundation to around justice and equity. Well, first of all, just I'm so happy to meet you and I'm and thank you for what you're doing. Um, when uh, I, I paid a, a pilgrimage to Pauli Murray uh, College to the gates at Yale and just wept, I couldn't believe that I was seeing mm. that. Um, what an extraordinary human being, what an extraordinary legacy. So I truly thank you for, for keeping uh, her legacy and nurturing it. Um, you know, we, so because we, it's, it's tricky, we're smaller than we might seem. Uh, and so we don't always give things to re-granters, but sometimes uh, there are organizations that are more um, able to make grants to lots and lots of the smaller organizations in a whole line of alignment. So for example, um, the National Historic Trust African American Action Fund, um, the, the work that Brent Legs is leading, um, is work that uh, we have supported broadly because with their expertise and their funds, they're able to reach you know many, many, many more places. Um, and I, that would, I wonder if if that's a place. Yeah. We are actually a beneficiary in the second okay. round of a grant from them. So we thank you for that as well. Okay, well, good. Well, then we're already connected. Yes. <laughs> um, and I think that also, um, you know, one of the things that with our, our, our program officers, our program associates, our program assistants, everyone in every job, I consider, um, you know, a, a, a truffle hunter, mm -hmm. you know, to say, you know, everybody eyes open, learning. What do you come from? Who do you know about? What are you learning? What are you keeping your eyes on? What are you involved with in your community? Um, and I think that, you know, back to my earlier point to Joel about coming from, you know, other worlds. Um, I think that that's the way that we're able to, 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 to feed our work at the scale that we're able to do with an understanding uh, uh, that is hopefully broad and not just what's right in front of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Okay, great. Next question. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I just said if, if if it's just my opportunity to complain about the mismanaged pandemic. If uh, if I were there, I could go and visit y'all at the Polly Murray house. Absolutely. So, we'll, we'll send another invitation. Okay, wonderful. Sorry, Cassie, next question. No worries, I'm writing this note down about when you come back, because we're bringing you back uh, about the Polymary Center, good. Okay, next question is from Adam Goldstein. Adam, if you'll unmute and ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. This is a great conversation, and thank you, Joel, for facilitating in the Sanford Center. Um, I'm a family physician in, in, in the Academic Health Center, and we're struggling uh, across the country with trying to 
uh, bring social justice into the curriculum that we teach uh, students of all sorts, as well as really how to create a more diverse, inclusive uh, uh, with minorities within medicine. And my question is, the work that you're doing in higher education, um, to, to what extent are the policies and programs that you're supporting and that you're aware of, are, are they translatable into uh, uh, academic uh, medicine and, and healthcare? Uh, is there a roadmap? Because we're all struggling simultaneously with the same issues and looking for these roadmaps that we can make these changes yesterday, not today, if not tomorrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, I think um, the Sloan Foundation, um, which um, doesn't, uh, it, it's not so much leading to medicine, but it's much more in the sciences and social science has sciences has a program very much like our Mellon Mays Fellowship uh, that, that helps build, bring people through in those fields. Um, but I think that the larger, the larger question is um, really one for all of us, um, which is without being flip, how do we just do it? You know? I mean, you know, one of um, uh, my great heroes, Ruth Simmons, um, uh, the great educator, um, uh, you know, I've, I've heard her say on multiple occasions, when people ask me how to uh, hire more people of color, I say, hire more people of color. So again, I'm not trying to be flip about it. What I'm saying is, how do we understand the resources and opportunities that we have? How do we live our lives every day uh, thinking about inclusiveness, thinking about resources and how we can share them, thinking about our own blind spots and what we have to learn about? Um, we uh, just uh, made a, a, a really beautiful series of grants with the Ford Foundation uh, for um, uh, uh, artists, disabled artists uh, who are, were given fellowships. Um, it's called uh, Disability Futures is the initiative. And um, I'm part of a, a group of um, foundation presidents. We're part of uh, something called the President's Council on Disability which again, our friend Darren Walker and, and, uh, and Richard Besser have come together to try to get us in our grant making uh, to uh, really deeply understand and consider disability as a category. Um, and you know, we, we, we learned, we are learning. We looked at what we don't know. Uh, we uh, questioned our assumptions. We learned about the language that uh, people do and don't uh, like when they're spoken about. Um, the disability movement um, uh, has a, a wonderful saying um, that says, um, nothing about us without us. Um, and so, you know, I have been, I, I'm just using that as an example, something that, 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 that I and, and, and Melon am learning so much about um, by not assuming that because we know a lot about one thing, that we know a lot about everything. So I, I'm saying that actually really in a, in a you know, uh, a, 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 a generously challenging spirit that I turn to myself as well um, uh, to say that, you know, each, every day we have opportunities to push ourselves in our communities and we know the communities we sit in best. Uh, so I think that the particulars of the solutions uh, will come from within those communities. I hope that's helpful. Okay, thanks. Okay, and next question is from Susan King. Susan, if you will unmute and ask yep. your question. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Alexander. I want you to know I interviewed your dad once and did a big story on him when I was a journalist in Washington. Susan uh, King TV, Washington, D.C. Yes. yes. Oh my goodness. It's so nice to see you. Now it's just like I'm watching you on television again. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't used to be blonde, though. It's great to see you. So, um, And you must be fantastic in the classroom. And I'm not going to ask a philanthropic question um, because I want to see you um, with all the enthusiasm that you shared, but to talk about a controversy, 
And Joel and I are close. I'm at UNC now, and I'm dean of the journalism mm -hmm. school here. And one oh. of our great grads won the Pulitzer this year, Nicole Hannah-Jones, for yes. 1619. Yes. Something we're very proud of. And a year later, it's even more controversial than it was before. It combines journalism, history, and culture, something you've talked about greatly. Give us a perspective on why this is roiling so from the Wall Street Journal right through the New York Times. You know, um, I'd love your perspective on it because it has really challenged so many of our students that very exciting on campus and yet there is so much pushback. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I have wondered that myself because, you know, prizes has, have been given, the work is published. You would think that all was said and done. Um, but I think that the work has become, um, uh, you know, the symbol uh, of the very intense culture wars that we are in right now. Uh, you know, right now, I mean, I, I really think that we are in, in real pitched, sometimes physical battle for how we tell the story of who we are. If you look, let's say, you know, you start with Charleston and the church massacre there. And you think then to all of the Confederate iconography that was part of Dylan Roof's ideology um, uh, that, that, that formed him. If let's say you then move to Charlottesville uh, and you think about you know, the, whose history, uh, whose icons, whose statues, uh, the numbers of statues uh, that have been taken down uh, in the last months even, uh, and certainly in the racial conflagration of the last summer, uh, have, have increased tremendously. But one of the things that we learned in the Monuments Project, and this re re relates to Nicole Hannah-Jones's work, is that when you look at, we're, 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 we've commissioned some big research that's gonna aggregate um, all of the information about who is represented but if you just look at it from what we know, 2014 National um, Heritage Designated Sites, 2% uh, uh, dedicated to African Americans, less than 1% Latinx people, less than one half of 1% Asian American people, less than that Native people, okay? So here we are just in this little teeny tiny 2%, right? And so the very real question of like, who are we? Um, but then I think also kept very alive, uh, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the president himself has uh, talked about 1619, has said they're taking down, they are taking down your statues, right? They aren't going to teach you the right history. They're gonna teach you the wrong history. So when you have like that level of, of um, exposure and battle to, to, to who counts, if you look at all the rhetoric of who belongs and who doesn't belong, who is American and who has not, um, that has had a real effect. So what I hope is that the moment that we're in is the last battle, if you will, because what I fervently believe is that if we tell our history in more of its complexity, that serves everyone. You know, how many Robert E. Lees do we need? I, d I wonder, you, you know, I mean, the, you, there are predominantly black schools where kids are going in to a place that says, you know, here, this, this is named for someone who represents an ideology that says some humans are superior to others and some humans are not even fully human. So um, I think that the 1619 Project was uh, saying, let's have a broader view of American history. You know, let's, let's look at it from this moment forward. And uh, I think that also probably the fact that um, she's a very, very uh, brilliant and very, very forthright Black woman, um, a very un unapologetic Black woman, uh, which is uh, how I think strong, brilliant women should be. Um, that that is also probably why she's become, um, frankly, and that work has become scapegoated. Um, and I worry about uh, the, 
the pitch of this conversation. I really do. Um, because, you know, uh, these are just very, very, very fraught and fraying times. Uh, and uh, if we look again at these other marks, you know, people have lost their lives. And uh, I, I think that we've, we, we've got to finally come to a place where uh, we realize that there is room for everybody at the table. So what a, what a wonderful question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Our next question is from a former Duke student of whom we are so proud, <laughs> Hannah Ford. Hannah, if you'll unmute. <laughs> Thanks, Cassie. Anna, hi. <laughs> I just saw you this morning on this screen. I know. I tried to find you on the chat, but I couldn't find you <laughs> for today. Um, so I'm I'm so honored um, to work with Elizabeth at Mellon and um, Elizabeth. When I'll just share this before I ask my question, which is when you talked about all of the amazing things that you bring um, as a teacher and as a poet to leading the foundation, I, those are all true. Um, and the, the level of rigor and, but also the um, amount of inspiration, I think that, that you bring in how you talk about our work and communicate our work and, and develop our work. Um, it inspires all of us. So I just wanted to share that. Um, so my question is actually, and I hope we haven't talked about this at Mellon and I've just missed it. I don't think we have or, or with, with my level of, of staff. Um, I, so I'm, I've been thinking a lot about cap, uh, multiple forms of capital. And I've also been thinking about how we have this big endowment. So we, we make beautiful, amazing grants, but we have a big endowment. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on mission related investing related to foundation endowments, impact investing related to foundation endowments. Um, but just, just your, your perspective on that. Um, and then along with thinking about how we can move the needle in non grant making ways, um, how you think about our work in partnership with government. I've been reflecting a lot on how health care and education philanthropy is often in partnership with government to move their work forward. And with the monuments project, it made me start thinking, oh my gosh, you know, maybe, maybe we're, maybe we need to be partnering more with government in the right way. So um, I'd love your thoughts on, on both of those questions as, as you're able to share. Okay, well, those are huge questions, um, and I'll start with the second part of the partnering with 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 government. Um, I think that um, certainly, as we start um, uh, working more deeply in the monuments project, um, there will be more um, uh, municipal uh, partnerships. We've already done some uh, with uh, the statue of um, J. Marion Sims uh, that was um, on uh, uh, East in East Harlem. And uh, he was uh, he was known as the father of gynecology, and he uh, performed very very uh, brutal uh, forced sterilizations and experiments upon enslaved women, and there he stood uh, on the edge of Harlem, you know, and you know. With the built environment, you walk by and sometimes you just think that's another statue. Sometimes you don't stop and think, well, who is that and why are they there? Um, and, uh, and once people in that community started to do that, they said, this is not who we want to take our children by every day. This is not who we revere. Um, and so there was a whole process within the city government of, uh, you know, there was a monuments commission and there's a, you know, landmarks commission. and. What do we do with this? And what does the community have to say? And, you know, if we move it, what, what is put in its place? And municipalities never have enough money, right? I, I mean, so I think that um, that partnership is, is interesting and complicated. Um, you know, what does it mean to be a partner? Um, you know, sometimes I think just fund something, you know, just help some people do something that they couldn't do otherwise. But how do you also interrupt the assumption that the philanthropy can kind of infinitely uh, fund those projects? And how do you choose uh, which projects to fund? A, a project that you know about that also involved uh, work with uh, the city, um, staying in New York for the moment, and the Central Park Conservancy uh, was our support of a statue of the abolitionist Lyons family. Uh, uh, Central Park um, before Frederick Law Olmsted built it, 
um, used to be uh, a place called Seneca Village. It was a community of free black community. Uh, and that community was raised to build Central Park. So all of these layers of knowledge and meaning, right? Uh, and then thinking also about, you know, who were the indigenous people who were there before that. Um, so there, there also is, you know, working, working with cities in partnerships. Um, as you know, in arts and culture in the United States, um, we don't, the government doesn't support arts and culture very robustly at all. Um, uh, if you look at, um, and you know, so, so much of, of the emergency work, Joel mentioned the $200 million that our board approved on top of our budget because we wanted to do emergency funding this year. And a lot of that was because we saw so many arts and culture organizations absolutely struggling. But like Germany, for example, uh, gave, I should have the number at hand, but it is in the billions uh, of, uh, of arts funding uh, in the face of COVID. Um, you know, the, the city of London, I think gave more uh, relief funding than the entire United States added up together. So I, I think that also, you know, as far as thinking about government partnerships in the long run, one of my long-term goals is if we do this work with others well enough, uh, I would love to think that over time, uh, you know, we, if we proselytize enough and exemplify enough the power and importance of art and of public art, you know, art that is accessible to people, then maybe uh, there might, you know, uh, that maybe that'll shift the culture a little bit. So, uh, to, you know, to that to that question is is a very kind of case by case, but really interesting interesting one. To the question of um, of mission related investments and and impact and in, impact investing, um, you know, bit by bit in um, moving the foundation into this new era that we're in, um, we're going across in every area and asking questions of equity, asking how is our money put to work asking, are we spending the maximum amount that we can, which is another very interesting question that I think goes along with the tough ones that you asked, uh, because of course there's a lot of, um, uh, of talk now about you know, what percentage payout uh, should foundations do, and it's been a very interesting exercise to think through, okay, here, you know, money shouldn't sit idle but what does it mean to be a legacy foundation and to want to be able to exist in the future? Um, I, think, I think we need to all be able to ask the question, call the question of drawdown. That's not what Mellon's gonna do, so don't you know, get too excited about that. But I do think it's important, you know, for example, if we, if we were a foundation that funded um, scientists developing vaccines. And if we knew that paying all our money would get us a COVID vaccine, and then we have to close our doors tomorrow, but there's a COVID vaccine, I would say develop that COVID vaccine, right? So, you know, we don't do any of those things, but I think that, 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 that the, the really hard work and art of thinking about the urgency of now and the long run uh, and doing that knowledgeably but humbly uh, is the challenge. One thing I did feel that I could say about this year uh, with the COVID pandemic, with its effects on the economy, with its effects on the arts and humanities and culture is that we've not seen a year like this one. Mm -hmm. And we've not seen the kind of devastation in cultural communities like we've seen this year. And so uh, that made it uh, very clear to me that um, spending as much as, as we could responsibly spend was the right thing to do and the board came along with it. So um, enthusiastically. So I, I say you asked a lot of questions and I've you know, kind of put a lot of things back into the space. Um, Elizabeth, you're getting the-, the, the It's dark. It's, I was gonna I say. Have, let me turn the lights on. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. Um, okay, let's hope that's, oh, that's, that's, a lot. that's okay. That's 
That's a lot better. <laughs> it's getting dark earlier, alas. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is here too. But it's getting dark faster there than it is here. Yes. Okay, Cassie. Okay, the, uh, the next is just a shout out. No one wants to ask the question. Liz Weiner of Weiner Family Foundation in Charlotte. Charlotte has embarked on the marker project with EJI led by our justice system. Thank you for calling out this tremendous work. So um, that was what you're doing. Thank you. That's great. Great. Okay. And the next question is from David Dotson. David, if you'll unmute and ask your question for us. I'm going to unmute and appear. Um, Dr. Alexander, thank you so much. And Joel, thank you for making this fascinating conversation possible. So um, my question is about the work that the foundation is doing, bringing the humanities to prisons and community colleges. And I say this as um, a just completed trustee of Public Welfare Foundation, which is devoted to criminal justice reform and restorative justice, and as a community college trustee. So, um, it, it seems to me that this kind of grant making really underscores just the respect and dignity that should be accorded to people who find themselves in, in these institutions. And where very often the kind of education that um, they receive is instrumental rather than um, liberal. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for recognizing just the inherent potential in people who find themselves in settings that are underinvested. My question, and you've talked about the impact on individuals, which has got to be colossal. Do you have um, signs or do you have expectations for what you hope will be the impact on the institutions of correctional institutions and community colleges by making these kinds of investments? I would think they would send a signal. Um, do you have expectations there and are you seeing changes? Well, that's a great question, which, which, which points to uh, an area still in development, which is how can we do really kind of interesting and qualitative measurement? Uh, you know, because there are some ways that straight numbers, like for example, there's um, some really great uh, uh, research about how neighborhoods that have arts institutions in them uh, derive, you know, economic uh, benefits, com community uh, ties are tight, you know, so forth and so on. So there are real benefits to having uh, arts organizations in neighborhoods and that's quantifiable. But I think that, that you know, sort of qualitatively, um, we're, we're, we're thinking how can we really and who can we work with um, to really measure the things that, that sometimes feel like they cannot be measured or that sometimes feel like um, they are best apprehended soul by soul. But in fact, you know, and, and I mean, I actually do believe that, that, that all of those people add up, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that we all see if we've been doing our work for the decades, you know, and the students grow up and the children grow up and they, you know, you know things get passed along and you, really do see how the seeds uh, are planted and start to grow. Um, but I think we're going to have to learn a lot um, uh, about uh, how we're going to, to do sort of impact measurement. I think that also one of the things that we think very carefully about, because again, you know, we, we can't sort of, you know, give everybody a dollar, right? So we're always choosing and trying to choose institutions or programs or leaders who are in some way powerful, shiny, exemplary. Because I think that then when that gets lifted up, I mean, that's what we've seen with, with someone like Dwayne Betts. You know, Dwayne is an extraordinary human being. Uh, Dwayne is a, actually he has a piece, well, he, you can, he's easy to find, but he has a piece about Kamala Harris in the Times that just is coming out today. But you know, he's, he's, he's a very compelling person and he is a wonderful messenger uh, for uh, the power of transformation uh, and building community. So that's what we're also always trying to think is not so much, you know, who's the special shiny one, but rather what's the place, the idea, the project. You see this in Brian Stevenson. Yeah. Well, Brian Stevenson um, is an extraordinary 
communicator, but he's got substance behind that, you know? Um, so I think uh, that um, that's a piece of how we think. With um, In our emergency COVID granting, this to your question about community colleges, um, we gave uh, $10 million to uh, the CUNY system. Uh, and, you know, if you live in New York City, I mean, their slogan, if you will, uh, you know, that CUNY is it's the engine of social mobility, you know? And if you, and if you think about uh, all of the people in this big, beautiful, dense, complex city uh, and the opportunity that an education affords them, uh, to me, the idea of not supporting CUNY just feels, it feels wrong. Um, and right now the leader um, of CUNY is someone who can really carry a message because I tell you, being the chancellor of, of CUNY uh, is a, very complicated job. <laughs> a lot of constituencies in this rambunctious place. Um, so um, so to, to measurement, still learning, and to um, impact, I think exemplarity is a really actually important part of what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, have you, if I may inter interrupt, have the leaders of the prisons generally been supportive of, of the kinds of things that you're doing, bringing books in, inspiring discussions of issues like, like that, or have you, and does it vary widely? Well, it, it, it varies widely. And again, I should emphasize that, you know, we, so, you know, we, we are, we are good partners, but like, it's all about the grantees and what, what they do, right? And they do the work. So one of the things that was really smart about the way that the Justice Collaboratory and Dwayne put the project together is they decided first to pilot it in states where they had already built relationships with uh, heads of departments of corrections. Um, you know, uh, because it, you, there are just some, some states you just wouldn't start in. Uh, because you, you'd know you weren't going to get anywhere and you'd expend a tremendous amount of effort doing it. So they were very, very strategic in that regard because, you know, success breeds success. And uh, sometimes, you know, I believe the power of a good idea executed well um, gets other people excited. And I think that also sometimes make them realize, like, what's actually the problem with books in prison? You know, it hasn't always been that it's been so hard to get books in prison. Right. Of course, the profounder question, the one for the society to answer, is why, why do we lock so many people up? Why do we lock up more people than anywhere on planet? <laughs> why do we think we are a fully human and humane society when we do that? So I hope that you know, ultimately, uh, we are helping people to ask questions at the root. Well, I'm sure that you've inspired a lot of us to ask questions at the root. We have one minute left, according to Cassie's schedule. It's actually don't have any minute left. Okay, we do as Cassie says. <laughs> we have to do as Cassie says. So, so what I'm supposed to do at this point um, is to wrap up the session um, with thanks to you for inspiring us, for coming, giving us the time, and for being so eloquent in dealing with questions that I think we all are grappling with happily and will learn a great deal from what you've said. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, a, a, and then the final thing I'm supposed to do is to just say that the, the last FERG session of the fall semester, we have a whole, um, a whole roster of people coming in the spring, but we haven't announced them yet. But but the last one in, in the fall is a, a talk by Nancy Rube, who is the president of the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation and the person who has really developed the idea of recruiting other philanthropies and individual philanthropists to come and work in partnership with that foundation. In addition to running the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, she's developed a number of, of, uh, of separate programs to which the foundation has contributed the most, re risk, most recent of which is Blue Meridian, which is focused on problems and where they're working with, with organizations that have been working with, particularly with youth um, uh, in a variety of different settings. Um, and she's attracted several billion dollars from people 
when she first told me about what she was going to do, I said, foundations and individuals aren't going to give you any money. They don't give money to other foundations. But she said, well, she's going to try anyway. She succeeded mightily. Uh, and it's on, on, on the landscape of philanthropy, it's one of the most exciting things. And your being at the Mellon Foundation is another exciting thing. And so uh, thank you for all, we, all you've said, all you're doing. And I hope very much that we will get you to come back down here when the, the, when the crowd, then the clouds of, of COVID-19 are gone and we can entertain you properly as we would have done if you come this time. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you all people who participated. It's a pleasure having all of you join us. Thank you very, very much and have a good evening. Thank you so much. I'm honored to have been with you all. Thank you for those great questions and uh, sending uh, good energy and love across the waves. Well, you've radiated more of it. So it's been, it's been rewarding to us as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank okay. you all and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. You too. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.